Hello and welcome back to the home lab. Looking a bit smarter today again because I've been out teaching maths. Anyway, I've got an interesting video for you today. What we're going to look at is the periodic table of elements, but we're going to look at the actual elements themselves rather than just pictures of them. I've always been interested in the periodic table of elements, um, particularly as a physicist, um, knowing how the atoms are constructed and the reason they do the chemistry that they do. And a while ago, um, I bought one of these little paperweights and it was sold as having the real elements on it. Well, in fact, what it has is photographs of the real elements. Um, but, you know, it's still quite a fun thing to have and I didn't think much about it until this Christmas, I got a Christmas present completely unannounced from my partner and what was in the box was another paperweight and I didn't want to tell her, I've already got one of those until I looked at it and I noticed that this one actually appears to have a sample of nearly all the elements that are in the periodic table. So, why don't we put it under the microscope and see whether we can tell that they are genuine and what we can do as well is have a quick chat about what each element might be used for. Just before we put this underneath the microscope, a quick mention of my sponsor PCBWay, who I'm really grateful to for encouraging me to constantly make new content. It just occurred to me that they obviously do circuit boards and things like that, but they also do CNC machining and 3D printing. And I thought they might be someone you could go to if you're making your own periodic table and you might want to make something like this or little boxes that you can put your elements in. Anyway, do go and have a look at their website. They've got lots of interesting ideas there and I'm sure you'll get an idea for your next project. So I've got it under the microscope now and let's kick off with hydrogen. So hydrogen, um, famous for the Hindenburg disaster. I don't know if there's actually any hydrogen in here. Um, difficult to know. And also possibly the fuel of the future. Now we've got to slide right the way across now. There won't be too much moving later on. And there's helium. Well, you're all familiar with uh, helium, uh, party balloons, that sort of thing. And it's also uh, quite an important gas used um, for cooling superconducting magnets. So back we go. And there's lithium, uh, third on the periodic table. Um, I think there is a sample of lithium in there, but I'm not quite sure... Um, What's happened to it? Um, lithium, uh, famous for batteries, and I think it was used um, as an antidepressant um, as well. Uh, then beryllium. Okay, beryllium's a really interesting element, and it's one I don't think I've ever worked uh, with at all. And you can see the uh, sort of interesting colour of perhaps the oxide there. Um, it's only formed in supernovae explosions, and um, it really allows x-rays to go through it quite nicely. Um, so it's used for x-ray windows where you need to uh, have an x-ray tube but you need to have an aperture in that tube that doesn't let air in but does let the x-rays out and uh, use a beryllium window. So cross we go and there we go uh, boron, uh, boron added to steel, um, carbon well biggest use of carbon around where I was was um, coal um, so uh, burning um, carbon. Nitrogen Gas we don't really make use of when we breathe, but um, it's one of the uh, uh, most abundant gases uh, in the atmosphere. Oxygen, of course, oxygen gas um, we need uh, to sustain life. And then uh, fluorine. OK, fluorine um, comes from, I think, the Latin to flow and uh, fluorides, um, salts of fluorine um, were used as uh, fluxes. Um, or at least to lower melting points um, in metal smelting. And then finally here we get to the noble gas, neon. Um, so noble doesn't really react with anything. And uh, neon um, is used in uh, lighting, those uh, neon lights that you've uh, seen. So we're going to go all the way back and now um, I think we're going to see more of the elements because they're not gases but they're solids. 
So here we go with sodium. Um, I don't know where my sample of sodium is um, there. I think there's probably a little bit in there somewhere, but it's quite reactive. Uh, sodium, you might remember, uh, quite well known for street lights, those street lights that took ages to come on and had a really orangey colour. Then magnesium, low density metal uh, that can be alloyed with other metals and uh, makes for very strong but very light casting. So um, things like racing car wheels. And then we'll slide across again. We'll stop doing this soon. And there's one I'm sure you'll be very familiar with. Aluminium. So much of it around after the war from aeroplanes, uh, they actually built houses out of it. Then silicon. Got plenty of silicon around here. Used for microchips, silicon chips and semiconductors. And then a lovely example of some red phosphorus. Quite reactive phosphorus um, used in explosives, munitions um, that will burn really, really well. And um, I think it's used for flares as well. And the last three here, sulphur, that lovely yellow colour. Remember seeing sulphur in uh, train hoppers and you saw beautiful um, sort of containers full of the yellow sulphur. Um, and the biggest use for sulphur, I think, is for making uh, sulfuric acid. Chlorine, really good disinfectant. Um, chlorine swimming pools, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. And finally, argon. Noble gas, um, so it's really good in argon arc welding for keeping the weld clean. So we're back at potassium now. I think there's a sample in there, but um, I can't uh, see it on mine. I think I need to get a bit closer in. Uh, but potassium um, used as a fertilizer, it gets its name from potash. Calcium, um, calcium of course used in batteries and scandium, um, again used in alloying for really lightweight aircraft alloys. So titanium there, and you can see the sort of colour of the sample of titanium metal. Again, um, very, very strong metal and used in alloys, um, particularly for aircraft parts. Um, I think some bicycles as well, bicycle frames. Uh, vanadium, um, very commonly used as a catalyst, and it does make steel stronger. And chromium, well, you don't see it on cars quite so much these days, but it's a metal that really doesn't rust or tarnish very much and can be used to coat on other surfaces to electroplate on and keep them looking really shiny. And I was thinking of car bumpers from back in the day. So we've slid across to manganese and manganese is used in batteries, uh, but it's also added to um, steel and it makes the steel kind of more workable, easier to um, make into the shapes that you want to make it into. Iron, um, it's going to go rusty. So you've got that little sort of red uh, rust colour. Um, iron, of course, for building all sorts of things, um, but particularly you can imagine uh, beams and things that are used in uh, building buildings. And cobalt's an interesting one. Uh, cobalt was added to glass to improve its uh, colour properties. And if you get the right amount in, the glass goes a lovely blue colour. I'm reminded of Bristol blue glass. Um, the radioactive version of cobalt is um, used as a cancer treatment. And you've got to be really careful because very, very, very small masses of cobalt are extremely radioactive. So here's nickel, and um, maybe you haven't heard a use of nickel uh, quite so much these days, but nickel was used a lot in batteries, rechargeable batteries and nickel cadmium batteries. Interestingly, next to it's copper, which also has extremely good electrical properties. And can you see that lovely colour of the copper? That really, um, I think it was called salmon pink. Um, and copper is an exceptionally good electrical conductor. And then a nice sample of zinc there with that slightly greyish colour to it. Um, zinc is put on top of iron sheeting to galvanise it and stop it from rusting quite as rapidly. So we'll slide across again to the next three. And these I'm very familiar with, you might not be, but gallium. Uh, gallium arsenide is used for uh, semiconductors, transistors. Germanium, some of the very early transistors and diodes um, had germanium in them. So these are uh, materials that have interesting electrical properties and can be made to conduct in only one direction. And arsenic, um, interesting, that's um, alloyed with um, lead um, for making lead acid batteries and it helps give some strength to the, uh, the weak lead plates in the battery and it's also sort of historically known for its toxicity. 
So slide across again. And that gets us right the way across to this side of the periodic table. So um, selenium, um, Greek, um, comes from the Greek for the moon. Um, it uses a glass additive. Again, we're making glass to improve uh, the colour properties of the glass. Uh, bromine, really nasty stuff. I have worked with bromine. Um, it's a cheap man's chemical weapon. It's horrible. It, 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 it sort of burns through rubber. It absolutely destroys your uh, skin and lungs. Not very nice at all. Um, you can compare its smell to that of chlorine, but a lot worse. And uh, krypton, um, again, a very interesting uh, noble gas, um, doesn't um, react with anything. And I believe it's used for um, lasers and I think also for some particular types of light bulbs. So we're at rubidium now. Now, this is one you won't come across in everyday life, but you might because rubidium is used for the purple colour in firework displays. Then we've got strontium. Um, and you can see um, some flecks of the metal there. I think it's little tapes of strontium, shiny metal. Um, the isotope of strontium, uh, strontium-90, is used in radioisotope thermoelectric generators. And these are things where the radioactivity in the little capsule generates electricity directly. And so it can be used uh, in space missions, especially where solar panels wouldn't work. But you wouldn't want to get the um, strontium out. It would be extremely radioactive. And finally here, yttrium. Um, yttrium, um, you might have some around. Um, it's used um, in LEDs to uh, make sure that LEDs give out the right colour of light. So let's slide across to another three. And there's zirconium. Uh, zirconium um, is something that stops corrosion on metals, but I'm more familiar with it from the nuclear industry and it's used in cladding of nuclear fuel rods. Then we've got uh, niobium. Uh, niobium sort of became famous um, for making wires for superconducting magnets. And molybdenum's um, an interesting one. It's added to steel um, and it's also added to some lubricants, but I'm more interested in it um, that the radioactive version of molybdenum um, decays and can make technician, and technician, we'll come across a bit later, is really useful in medical scans. So across to the next three. And there is our technician. It's got to be close because um, it's formed by the decay of molybdenum. And I've told you it's used for uh, scans in hospitals. Uh, but I haven't got a sample here, obviously, because it's radioactive. Then we've got some ruthenium. And ruthenium, named after Russia, um, is a material that's used in very small amounts um, to improve electrical contacts. And then rhodium. Uh, rhodium's used in catalytic converters in cars. And in the nuclear industry, um, it's used in neutron flux detectors to measure the amount of um, neutrons being produced in a nuclear reactor. Uh, we'll just go across a bit now to palladium because palladium has some uh, similarities to rhodium. And palladium is uh, also used in catalytic converters in cars. Silver, as you know, um, used for all sorts of things, silver solders, but particularly jewellery. And cadmium, something we're trying to get rid of now because of its um, toxicity. And there's a nice little uh, cadmium pearl there, a little bead of cadmium, um, used uh, in batteries a great deal. But it made them rather toxic to recycle. So across now to indium. Well, as you probably guess, um, its name comes from India originally and from indigo, which was a kind of blue colour, a blue dye. And it's used as a coating now in flat panel um, displays, the sort of um, computer displays that you see. Uh, tin, famous for tin cans, uh, which you don't make a can out of. Uh, you make the can out of steel and then you coat it in tin, uh, which stops it from being attacked by the, the contents. So it's a coating on the actual can, which isn't made of tin. And then antimony um, used uh, in solder alloys to Im improve the solder and also again in plates for lead acid batteries um, to give them a bit more rigidity. And I believe some of the salts are really quite toxic as well. So over to, and this was the one that surprised me, tellurium. Now, you probably don't know anything about tellurium, 
But if you know something about it, it's the fact that the salts of tellurium, and I was quite surprised that there's a little sample of it in here, if you swallow the smallest amount of tellurium, which is, this is why there's not much chemistry being done on it, um, and it doesn't have a, a great deal um, of um, uses, um, the smell that it produces is phenomenal. Your sweat smells of um, way worse than garlic. And um, scientists who work with tellurium really can't go near anyone else um, for weeks and months because um, it does something really strange to your metabolism. Named after the earth, of course, um, Tellus. And it is actually used um, in solar panels a little bit these days. But I wouldn't want to get near any of the salts of it for that reason. Iodine. Yep, that has a smell um, if you've ever smelt it. And it has this sort of uh, deep red going to a sort of orangey uh, colour. And you might have had it painted on you as an antiseptic um, used on wounds or to clean your skin before surgery. And then xenon, another noble gas, and xenon used in uh, light bulbs, uh, a special kind of light bulb that gives really, really bright flashes of light um, used on sort of camera flashes and things like that. So let's slide back again. See some of the elements we've looked at already there. And this one surprised me, the cesium. Um, I never really realised um, that cesium had this colour. So, um, um, and I've looked it up and I didn't realise that it was actually, uh, can form a sort of really golden colour, but it can. Um, cesium um, actually discovered by Mr. Bunsen, Robert Bunsen, and it's used in atomic clocks. Uh, barium, okay, uh, barium uh, is used in uh, high temperature superconductors, and I seem to remember it was a contrast agent in x rays, I think. So you used to be given a barium meal and you used to um, swallow some barium salts and it would show up the blockage inside you. So um, now something really interesting happens. The periodic table. Um, sort of has a big break in it. Um, and um, we've got to now move down to the bit um, that's sort of missing. They always put it on the bottom of the periodic table. Um, and we're going to look at lanthanum. So I've moved down to the lanthanide. So you kind of break the periodic table in half and push the two sides apart. And I don't know why I said lanthanoids, I say lanthanides. And here's lanthanum, um, looks quite dark, quite black in this sample. Um, it comes from the Greek word to lay hidden uh, because it was found um, with other elements when they were discovered. And uh, finally they removed yet another element, uh, the hidden element, and that was lanthanum. Then we got some cerium. Uh, cerium is used as a phosphor um, in LEDs. Um, it helps uh, make white LEDs white. And prysodenium, well, you'll never guess the use of this. Uh, one of the uses is really interesting. Um, it shows magnetocaloric effects. OK, that's something a bit weird in physics. Um, it means that in particular magnetic fields, you can cool the atoms down and it's used to get atom samples down to as close as you can to absolute zero. So when I was a kid, I probably hadn't heard of neodymium, um, but uh, you probably heard of it now because it's used um, in alloys to make really strong permanent magnets. Then promethium. Well, you remember I mentioned making radioactive batteries. There's a bit of a squiggle there, but I'm pretty certain there isn't a sample in there, but maybe there is. Um, and uh, promethium is used in uh, batteries that contain a radioisotope, um, so they last for a very long time. And a good place for those is in pacemakers, where you don't want to be sort of opening yourself up and changing your battery every week. And then samarium there, um, again, used in magnets. It's um, alloyed into magnets to make very strong permanent magnets. Sliding across, we get to europium. Don't need to tell you what that's um, named after. And this has wonderful phosphorescent properties. Um, it can take in light, uh, high energy light, and then give the light back out over a longer period of time with um, lower energy wavelengths. Gadolonium. OK, well, I mentioned uh, contrast agents a while ago um, with barium and X-rays. Um, this is a contrast agent. I'm not quite sure how you would use it. I think it's injected into the bloodstream um, with MRI scans. 
And Terbium, a uh, bit of a mystery for me, this one. Um, I had to look it up, but I believe Terbium is used in very specialised and possibly quite secret sonar systems. So we've now come to some really rather interesting and odd atoms and ones you may not have come across before. Dysprosium um, is used in lasers and it's actually a Faraday rotator. Uh, what that basically means is the light goes in wiggling in one direction and comes out wiggling in a different direction. In other words, it rotates the plane of polarization. A uh, Faraday rotator does that. Holmium. Uh, holmium again has some really interesting properties and its oxide is used in spectroscopy because it's got some very very specific absorption lines and you actually can have a sample of it that you can put in your spectrometer and you can use it to calibrate the spectrometer. And then erbium uh, erbium is actually really important these days. It's used in very specialized lasers, um, the lasers that are used for laser surgery. So look at these lovely samples here, particularly the thulium, uh, this really nice shiny metal that we've got here. Now this is a really interesting atom. Uh, one of the isotopes uh, actually gives out x-rays. So if you think about it, you could have a tiny speck of this metal giving out x-rays and use it to x-ray uh, metals to see if there are any cracks or um, distortions or damages within the structure or within welds, etc. And yet it's going to be really tiny. It's going to be like a really mini x-ray machine so it can get into places that you couldn't normally get uh, an x-ray tube into. Ytterbium also has similar properties. Um, you can use that as a sort of mini x-ray source and it's the isotope 169 that's needed there. Um, interesting you'll notice we've got 173.05 and maybe in a minute I should talk about why that isn't an integer value, why we've got this 0 0.05. And luthium um, again, another very interesting use of this. It has a very, very long half-life, about 38 billion years. So it does decay and you can pick up chemically how much of it has decayed. And if you can do that, you can use it to date rocks and minerals. So we've now done the lanthanide, so we have to head back into the periodic table, the main body of it and the way it's normally drawn, and find element 72. So we've got to hafnium and hafnium is used in the nuclear industry. Uh, it's a particularly good absorber of neutrons. Then tantalum, and you can see that lovely little bit of uh, tantalum foil there. Uh, tantalum, I'm familiar with it in electronics. Um, it's used in tantalum bead capacitors. So these are things that store small amounts of electrical charge. And tungsten, I'd be really interested to know what's happening to the world use of tungsten. Because of course what tungsten was used for uh, was light bulb filaments because it had a very very high melting point. But I wonder whether there's um, less interest in tungsten now because obviously we switched over to LED lighting. Um, rhenium uh, named after the Rhine River is very very rare indeed. It has an exceptionally high melting point it's brilliant for alloying in steels and it's used for things like turbine blades which live in very very hot environments. Osmium, now that's an interesting one. Um, it has very very high wear resistance, it's quite a nice interesting sort of grey colour there and um, again uh, not such a modern use but it was used for the tips of fountain pens because they used to wear down so if you put a little bit of osmium on the tip of a fountain pen nib it wouldn't wear down quite as rapidly. And then iridium. Now this is really interesting. There's a platinum iridium bar which is in Paris and that's the international prototype of the meter. It is exactly a meter long because it says it is and every other meter had to be measured from that one. And I think one of the things about platinum iridium alloys uh, was um, they don't um, rust particularly and I think they have very good thermal properties. I don't think they expand and contract as the temperature changes. So your meter is your meter. Now we measure the meter in a different way now using um, laser beams but uh, back in the day that was the standard for the meter and if it changed in length then the meter changed in length. It was that that defined how long a meter really was. And we'll slide over again to the next three and look at the wonderful colours there. 
So uh, platinum, this lovely shiny silvery colour used for um, really expensive jewellery and um, it's not reactive at all really so it's used a lot for catalysts. And then a little sample of gold there, I think it looks like a gold nugget rather than a bit of um, gold foil and obviously gold uh, all sorts of uses but um, I suppose we could talk about jewellery, uh, we could talk about the gold standard and gold coins uh, but we could also mention that gold is used a lot in electrical contacts because it doesn't tarnish and it's a really good conductor of electricity. I, I seem to find this in physics that if you find something that's really really good it also seems to be really really expensive. Now mercury, I've got a funny feeling that you can't sell products in the UK with uh, metallic mercury and liquid mercury, that lovely um, metal that is liquid at room temperature. So I think this is mercuric oxide but I find that equally interesting because look at the wonderful uh, colour of that, that wonderful sort of bright orangey colour. Now mercury um, is a real health hazard um, or at least is considered to be so they've tried to massively cut down its uses and one of the common uses uh, of mercury back in the day was for those little tiny button cell batteries and uh, they ha had mercury salts in them and were really quite dangerous and should be uh, recycled and not used again so in battery technology. So a lovely sample here of thallium and you can see a little bit of metal, a sort of bit of wire cut off there. Uh, thallium has a really interesting property, um, it changes its resistance when light hits it so it's used for photoresistors, things like LDRs in electrical circuits. Then a little tiny piece of lead and it does have that look of lead, that lead oxide on the surface if you were to scrape that grey colour off you'd see the metallic lead underneath, um, really malleable malus hammer, you can bend it and shape it into things so it was used um, for decorations and sort of sealing on roofs a great deal and of course its main use is the lead acid battery for the lead plates inside the battery. Considered to be quite toxic um, so we're trying to get rid of that technology. And then bismuth, uh, this is an interesting one, um, its salts are used for two interesting um, applications. One of them is it's used for pigments, that's some um, colourings and also you might have heard of Pepto-Bismol which contains bismuth, um, that's used as a treatment for diarrhoea. So the final three across here, I'm not going to spend much time with the radioactive ones because we haven't got samples and that's what you really want to see but uh, polonium uh, made famous, polonium-210, um, highly radioactive and made famous for attempts on uh, poisoning spies. Um, astatine, um, I can't think of any uses of that really other than um, in research but I believe it is used for treating some cancers, I think thyroid cancers. And then radon, um, an absolute nuisance, this is the one that seeps up um, from the ground, from uh, radioactive rocks in the ground, things like granite etc and uh, it can give you really bad uh, lung cancer. I have actually worked with radon, um, I used it um, from a thorium radon generator, we collected some radon and then uh, measured its half-life because it has a very very short half-life but one that you can actually measure in a laboratory. So as I said I won't spend too long on the radioactive uh, elements but um, we've just very quickly it might be worth mentioning francium. So uh, francium uh, know absolutely nothing about it in terms of working with it uh, but francium is so incredibly radioactive that the heat it generates from its own radioactivity uh, vaporises it on the spot as far as I know. Uh, radium um, this is a very famous one, um, I've done videos on um, radium paints before, um, radium can be added to other materials to produce incredibly good glow-in-the-dark paints. So uh, we looked uh, before at uh, the lanthanides and now what we need to do is again push the periodic table apart and look at the actinides. So we're down at the actinides now and uh, Actinium, uh, not many uses for this, very very radioactive uh, but used in cancer therapy so a source of radiation. Then a lovely little sample there, a bit of thorium wire, uh, this had an interesting use, um, thorium uh, salts were used on gas mantles, um, the sort of things that covered the gas flame on old gas lamps and it glue really really bright white when heated up 
but it was using a radioactive isotope of thorium and uh, they've obviously tried to get rid of these completely but we use some um, light bulbs these days. Protactinium, again quite interesting, um, the internet says it doesn't have any uses, uh, yeah I suppose uh, in research uh, etc. Um, I've used protactinium um, but I've used it in education, um, you use a protactinium generator, you generate some protactinium and then you can measure its half-life which is really quite short and can be done in a single school lesson. And across we go here to uranium. So you might wonder uh, what's that? Um, well there isn't a sample of uranium in here, I suppose you could get some depleted uranium uh, which is used for uh, munitions uh, because it's very very dense, using aircraft as well as balance weights. I think that's a piece of uranium glass and they actually used to make um, vases and things out of glass with uranium in it, it had a really weird sort of greeny uh, hue to it, not necessarily because it was radioactive um, though of course it was. Uh, that's it Okay, um, 92 is the last one that's sort of found on Earth. All the rest, um, Neptunium, um, a plutonium, I'm just thinking of nuclear reactor fuel there, americium, curium, Marie Curie, berkelium, uh, californium, you can guess where these are named after, einsteinium, fermium, Enrico Fermi, Mendelevium at last, the periodic table chap, Nobelium, Alfred Nobel and Lorentzium, again named after um, a very famous scientist. They're all man-made radioisotopes and are extremely radioactive and are really only found in research laboratories. So I do hope you enjoyed your look at all the different atoms in the periodic table that I've got and the samples that we can see under the microscope. I thought I might just end this part by talking just a little bit about what all this notation is, what these numbers and letters are. Well, of course I've picked platinum, gold and mercury because they're the really pretty ones here. Uh, the PT for platinum, AU uh, is the atomic symbol for gold and HG the atomic symbol for mercury so it doesn't necessarily use the, the English name that's there, it can be a Latin one. Um, the other thing is the atomic number, so platinum 78, gold 79 and mercury 80. That's its position in the periodic table or I like to think of it as the number of protons in the nucleus. Underneath you can see the name and then uh, perhaps look at gold, the atomic mass, okay so uh, 196.97, well you would normally see 197 and the atomic mass is made up of the number of protons and number of neutrons in the nucleus. So if you took 197 and you took away from it 79, you're taking away the number of protons, you'd have the number of neutrons in the atomic nucleus. But you'll notice it doesn't quite work and I could go on for hours about this but I'll just do it very quickly. Gold for example has a nucleus that's slightly on the light side. And the reason for that is that you need energy to pull the protons and neutrons apart. And yes, to pull the neutrons apart, um, even though they're not charged, so they don't stick together through charge. And if you think about it, isn't it odd that protons, which are both positive, stick together? And that energy that is missing is the missing mass, var equals mc squared, and we call that the binding energy. In other words, the binding energy is the energy the nucleus doesn't have, in other words it's lost a little bit of energy to stick together and that energy shows itself up as a reduction in mass. So instead of this gold here being 197.000000, it's slightly on the light side, slightly short of mass because that mass is the energy that it's short of to separate the particles and that is the nuclear binding energy. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on the periodic table of elements and that you got to see uh, some of the elements for real in this little paperweight of mine which I think is really rather impressive. Uh, maybe you've made your own or you're making your own and you're slowly but surely collecting the elements or at least quite often um, the elements in compounds uh, which makes it a little bit easier. Anyway I'll be making another video soon and I hope you'll join me then.